thank you. I'm, uh, is that okay, the sound? Yeah? I'm uh, really uh, quite pleased to be here, um, because, uh, particularly because I, I played uh, like a tiny role at the very, very beginning. I mean, before the report on the oceans uh, even uh, was uh, selected as an IPCC report, I had a call from uh, the pr Principality of Monaco uh, inviting me for lunch uh, in Paris. And the goal of the lunch was actually to see was there enough material there to do a report on the cryosphere and the ocean. And it was very exciting to see this project in a small way just come to light uh, just three years uh, afterwards. Uh, the ocean is no mystery, is 70% covering the planet. And I really quite like this picture here because anybody who has a globe, you can actually turn the globe in such a way that all you see is oceans. I don't know if you know this, but this is the picture you get. This is the view of the Pacific. And as an oceanographer myself, in my office, my globe is turned with this direction, which is completely opposite to um, well, the kind of things we talked about, the land this morning. So 70% of the Earth's surface, the oceans absorb a quarter of the CO2 we emit to the atmosphere every year. So by doing this, it slows down greatly the rate of global warming, extremely important services. 680 million people uh, live within 10 meters of the sea level as it is today. So very vulnerable populations live within reach of the sea. And the cryosphere, of course, so that frozen part of the Earth is at the forefront of impacts on climate change with melting sea ice, the Arctic in particular, which you see there. That's from September this year. Uh, mountain glaciers, ice sheet, and the melting of permafrost, the thawing of permafrost, apologies, uh, that uh, has the potential to release carbon to the atmosphere in sort of biggish quantities. So all these have actually very rapid, or have shown very rapid changes in the past um, decades that uh, the IPCC sums up for us in uh, this report, which we'll hear about today. Uh, we have, uh, at the Royal Society, we have uh, essentially done a review of that report, uh, as well as a review of what the evidence means for the UK, and published this in this little um, brochure here, which you see at the bottom. And I'm hoping the discussion in the second half of this sort of session can look into a little bit more in the UK dimensions recognizing that the UK doesn't have um, glacials and glaciers and perm permafrost, but it d does have uh, quite a lot of sea exposed coasts. It has a lot of uh, fisheries and ecosystems in the coastal area. And it also has a very big international presence with diplomatic efforts uh, going uh, worldwide. Um, as a scientist myself, I'm heartened by the fact that the two most powerful signs that we've had in the past two years are not the IPCC report, actually, but they're sort of an awakening that has been happening. We've talked about it this morning, about climate science in the past year, but this dates two years for the ocean, with the Blue Planet 2 having a tremendous impact on the perception of the value of the sea in the population, and particularly for me, uh, politicians that are haunted by an environmental problem is quite a, a, a very big uh, sign or a signal that things are changing in mentalities, both population and political. And, and also the naming of the boat Team McBoat phase, this NERC competition for naming a ship that had huge global reach for what is after all just a, like a very, very technical toy that scientists used to go to the Arctic. And the way that NERC uh, handled it, uh, I thought was really great, naming the submarine in the end, which is also a very big exploratory uh, device, and using this to help uh, the, the, the public understanding of, of science. So I think we live in very, very interesting times. And I want to just spend a few minutes before we go into the heart of the subject to say that, to me, this goes along with the interactions between science and policy and the things that we're doing today, which also, I mean, this is my own photo album here, which also shows how, I mean, for decades, the scientists sat at the IPCC level. This is me here for AR3 at 4 a.m. in the morning. 
and we sat at the IPCC level for many, many years, and for the following decade before the Paris Agreement was signed, there was a lot of effort from scientists to go and outreach. And believe me, when you sit in a panel like this and you're a scientist here in the middle, you're a long way out of your comfort zone. And I really like this direction of travel that we're doing together, like today, with a lot of interactions, because the scientific methods and the scientists that, uh, that, that sort of offer them are very important, I think, in this transition towards a sustainable uh, future. And also because I thought perhaps there was a possibility that we run out of a job after the IPCCs are published, and so we're creating a whole new environment for ourselves. And as evidence of this, I also put the two best pictures of me after my wedding picture on the right-hand corner, which uh, actually does uh, suggest that there's a very big interest out there to be photographed with scientists. Um, <laughs> uh, without any further comments, I would now like to uh, uh, introduce the first speaker. So the three speakers will uh, go over the evidence as covered by the uh, IPCC Oceans and Cryosphere Report. The first speaker, Professor Mike uh, Meredith, was a coordinating lead author for the Polar Regions chapter in this IPCC report. He is an oceanographer himself. He's a science leader at the British Antarctic Survey and has done uh, particularly a lot of work in the Southern Ocean. So Mike, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, thank you, Corin. Um, while this has been lined up, I'll start with a disclaimer, which is that, um, as Corin mentioned, I was one of the leaders of the Polar Regions chapter in the Oceans and Climate Report. Um, I was asked today to also cover a little bit about the High Mountains chapter, um, which is about, is about as far away from the oceans as you can possibly get. So I feel a little bit underqualified. However, I'll throw in a few uh, statements about that. But if there are any uh, telling questions about High Mountains, I might have to deflect those to other people. Um, this really just reiterates a few of the points that Corin uh, made in her introduction. Um, on the right, you can see one of the one of the best known facts about the planet Earth, which is that more than 70% of it is covered by ocean. Uh, as well as that, you can also see more than 10% of it is actually covered by ice, the cryosphere, the ice sheets and the glaciers, which means that in total more than 80% uh, is surface of the, of the world that is covered in the S-Rock report. This matters hugely from a climatic point of view. It also matters hugely from a societal point of view. In terms of the number of people affected, uh, I think Corin mentioned there's 680 million people living in coastal areas around the world. There's a similar number living in the high mountain regions around the world, and there's millions more that depend on the resources from those regions, uh, including water. Um, so it's not overstating it to say that the vast majority of the world's population depend either directly or indirectly on the ocean and on the cryosphere. Why should the UK care? Um, we are quite a long way from most of the big cryosphere. Uh, we don't have very many large mountains. We are surrounded by ocean, so that's certainly uh, a, a telling aspect there. And Phil Williamson will expand on that when he talks. Certainly aspects like sea level rise um, are very telling for us. Uh, certainly in London, where we are now, these are the sorts of changes in sea level that we might be encountering over the course of this century, depending on the choices that are made. The greatest contribution to that sea level rise will come from the ice sheets and from the glaciers. Uh, the greatest uncertainty in that sea level rise, or the projections as they currently stand, come from uncertainty in the future of Antarctica. Uh, we know also that the polar regions uh, have huge impacts around the world on planetary scale climate. Uh, and increasingly, we're seeing that they have the potential to influence weather at lower latitudes. Uh, and we're seeing Arctic processes can influence lower latitude weather on a range of timescales uh, and in ways that we hadn't previously seen. Another aspect that the UK should care about very uh, significantly, of course, is fisheries. Um, and what will happen under climate change 
as those resources change, as those resources move. And again, I think Phil will pick this up. Uh, and also in the diplomatic space. Um, the UK, we're here on mainland UK, um, but there's also overseas territories, some of which are adjacent to, uh, some of which are in the polar regions. And there, there are issues relating to governance, adaptation to climate change, policy, marine protected areas, and so on. So although the cryosphere may seem a long way away, um, there are certainly some big aspects uh, that the UK should care about. Now, I thought I'd just bring out a few of um, the key points from the SROC report that touch on these themes. Uh, this relates to the high mountains. Uh, some of the things that were highlighted in the report are the changes in the smaller glaciers um, in the high mountain areas, such as Europe, East Africa, the tropical Andes. Uh, and these are projected to lose more than 80% of their current ice mass during the course of this century uh, if emissions continue to increase strongly. This has consequences. Uh, as the glaciers melt and the snow cover shrinks, what you see is a, a contraction of habitat. So the species that are adapted to the cold environments will migrate upslope uh, and risk extinction uh, if conservation measures uh, in particular are not put in place. It also has implications for recreation activities and tourism, so people's livelihoods depend on these, and also cultural assets, uh, the people that live in these areas. There are implications also for safety and for uh, preservation of life. Uh, the report does highlight that uh, things such as landslides, avalanches, floods will increase as the glaciers retreat and as the permafrost declines. There'll be changes in water availability and water quality, which will affect households, agriculture, and energy systems. Uh, it does note that these hazards can be minimized by limiting warming, uh, ideally to the 1.5 degree level. This is the aspirational target of the Paris Agreement. And there's also scope for adaptation options with things like integrated water management and transboundary cooperation to try and reduce the impacts of the climate-related cryosphere changes. A few thoughts about the polar regions uh, that emerged strongly from the SROC report. Uh, I mentioned briefly some of the big ice sheets, uh, and these are obviously very uh, key and defining characteristics of the polar regions, uh, and they're changing, and they're changing actually quite rapidly. What we've seen is that the ice mass loss from Greenland doubled over the period 20, uh, 2007 to 2016 relative to the preceding decade. And over the same period, the ice mass loss from Antarctica Triple. One of the consequences of this uh, is that the global sea level rise is accelerating. Uh, these ice sheets will continue to melt during the course uh, of this century, uh, committing the planet to long-term global sea level rise. Uh, and Matt Collins will pick up on this when he talks in a few moments. Another change, uh, the Arctic sea ice is declining. Uh, we're seeing that in every month of the year. And the Arctic sea ice is thinning. Uh, and one of the key facts that comes out, which actually uh, is quite synergistic with the 1.5 degree report, a global warming of 1.5, what we see is the Arctic will be rarely free of sea ice in September, which is the month of minimum sea ice. Uh, at two degrees warming, uh, this will occur up to one year in three. So a very dramatic difference between even those relatively small levels of global warming. <coughs> Digging into the weeds a little bit, um, this shows changes in Arctic sea ice, which I just mentioned. This is one of the most iconic plots, I think, in climate change probably anywhere in the world. If you look at the plot on the left, the brown patch around the rim of the Arctic shows where the Arctic sea ice has uh, contracted in recent decades. Uh, the plot on the right, where you can see the reds in the same area, that shows the temperature of the surface of the ocean uh, for the same month. And you can see that the thinning of the ice, the retreat of the ice, very strongly coupled to a, a strong warming of the ocean in the Arctic. Uh, the changes we're seeing are likely unprecedented in at least a thousand years. And as I mentioned, there are significant implications on this for global climate through changes in albedo and also potentially on mid-latitude weather. There are other more local changes that occur um, as a consequence of these uh, sea ice and ocean temperature changes. This is a schematic of the impacts on the Arctic ecosystems. Um, I won't walk you through all of this because there's a lot of information here, but what I would ask is that you 
look at the, uh, the squares at the top. The squares colored orange um, are the ones where there's a perceived negative impact of climate change on the marine ecosystem. Uh, the squares colored in blue are where there's a perceived positive impact. And the point here is that it's just far more orange than blue. It's not completely uniform, but there's many more losers than winners in the marine ecosystem under climate change. Now this has implications for traditional communities, for fishing and hunting. It affects um, incomes and livelihoods. It affects food security, it affects fishing, um, and potentially it could lead to resource conflicts at different scales. Just for the sake of completeness, this is the comparable figure from the report for Antarctic marine ecosystems. It's a, it's a different system, but again, you can see there are many more negative impacts than there are positive impacts of climate change to these Antarctic marine ecosystems. You may be slightly misled by the row of blues uh, on the right-hand column, where these are perceived positive impacts. Um, this is simply because there's more ocean than there used to be as ice shelves around Antarctica collapse. Um, so if you live in the ocean, you might think that's a good thing, but in fact, at best, it's very much a double-edged sword and it is strongly related um, to the loss of the Antarctic cryosphere. Again, there are implications for fisheries, biodiversity, conservation, biological cycling of carbon, and so on. Another polar change I really wanted to flag um, relates to permafrost. Um, this is in the Arctic. We know the permafrost is thawing. Um, this has been seen in direct observational records. This has the potential to add more greenhouse gas to the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide, uh, also in the form of methane, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas. And what the report highlights is that if global warming is limited to well below 2 degrees C, around one quarter of the near surface permafrost will thaw by 2100, uh, and that's a, a significant amount already. If emissions continue to increase strongly, around 70% of the near surface permafrost in the Arctic could be lost. That has very strong climatic consequences. It also has strong consequences for the people who live in the Arctic, especially the indigenous peoples. Um, they're trying to adapt their activities to the changes that are already happening uh, in terms of changing their seasonality of their activity, in terms of changing their behaviors. Uh, their success in adaptation depends on funding and capacity and support. Uh, a, f a further change, I've alluded to this slightly already, but it is the future of the, uh, the cryosphere, Antarctica and Greenland, and also the glaciers, the mountain glaciers and the smaller polar glaciers. Sea level rise during the course of this century is inevitable. However, and you can see this especially in the bottom plot here, the level of sea level rise that we expose ourselves to depends very strongly on the choices that we make. Uh, under a low emissions scenario, the sea level rise by the end of the century is projected to be, uh, from glaciers, is projected to be around half that, uh, that it would be under a high emission scenario. Um, so there are strong policy relevant imperatives to actually deal with these issues. So drawing it all together, um, trying to synergize all these aspects from the report and the other ones I haven't had time to talk about, I thought there are maybe three overarching messages um, that emerge. One is that the climate-induced changes in the polar and high mountain regions are affecting um, certainly the local populations, the local environments, but also the global environments. There's pretty much everyone in the world is affected by these changes, either directly or indirectly. It's inevitable that the polar regions and the high mountain regions in the future will look significantly different to how they look today um, across many of their dimensions, many of their aspects. But there are choices available that will influence the nature and the magnitude of those changes. And they'll potentially limit their impacts, increase the effectiveness of adaptation actions. The final slide, um, this, this goes to the report as a whole, not necessarily just the polar regions and the high mountains uh, of the chapter, but I do think there are points worth making. The report as a whole really does highlight the urgency of prioritizing timely, ambitious, and coordinated action to address these issues. Uh, what it seeks to do is to empower people and communities and governments, so all across society, to tackle the unprecedented transitions. Um, and it provides the evidence, the scientific basis for the local um, 
the local knowledge and also bringing in indigenous knowledge, which is something IPCC previously had not done, at least to the extent that this report um, has chosen to do. And that's especially true for the polar regions chapter uh, in the Arctic. And a further aspect that it brings through um, for the first time in the IPCC, at least to this scale, uh, is the importance of education and climate literacy, which is really about building uh, capacity for the future. I shall stop there. Thank you very much. Stay around. Just we'll take a few questions. Are there any questions or comments on Mike's uh, presentation? Um, I'm from a law and policy background, and I've been noticing uh, over the past year or so there's been initiatives uh, being aired to harvest water from the Antarctic as an opportunity. So to move water from a location that you know uh, is going to is going to melt and move it to South Africa or bottle it and start to sell it uh, to raise funding for climate action initiatives. And I just wondered because. Obviously, most of what you're talking about is uh, uh, trying to incentivize mitigation and then there'll be adaptation issues. But then, you know, the water is uh, um, melting. Uh, is there some initiatives that actually do hold water, as it were? I mean, this, this maps into a, uh, into a very interesting area, which is the asymmetry between the Antarctic and the Arctic in relation to governance. Um, the Antarctic is covered by the Antarctic Treaty, so um, commercial interests, um, hydrocarbon exploration, things like this, very heavily governed, in many cases prohibited under the Antarctic Treaty. Um, I think initiatives like the one you're alluding to would have to clear an awful lot of hurdles to be even considered to be permitted, and probably rightly so. <laughs> the Arctic um, has a, a, a very different governance landscape in that there's, there's national interests, there's uh, EEZs, there's open, um, the Central Arctic Ocean is sort of high seas governed under UNCLOS. Um, there are international treaties, um, but there's also local governments and indigenous peoples councils. Um, so getting those sorts of uh, collective action on um, commercial exploitation, how it's managed, it's not just these sorts of schemes, but it's fisheries, it's um, hydrocarbons, it's minerals. These all need to be managed very, very closely um, and in a synergistic way um, so that policy on one actually supports policy on the other and doesn't undermine it. Schemes like this can be considered, um, probably not for the Antarctic, but maybe for other places. But again, it has to fit into that landscape of supporting the action to make sustainable development rather than undermining it. That's a very long answer to a very short question, and I apologize. <laughs> Any other qu questions? Uh, Mike, you haven't mentioned the ocean circulation very much. Um, are, are we at the point where we can anticipate what the implications are of climate change for ocean circulations? And are these taken into account when managing the, the impacts, I guess, of climate change in both hemispheres? I, I didn't mention it much. I didn't want to stray too much into the stuff that I really would talk for all day yeah. about. Um, I think one of the things that we see and is reiterated in the report is the importance of the circulation in the Southern Ocean Mm -hmm. on a global scale. The Southern Ocean is where huge amounts of heat and carbon are drawn down from the atmosphere and stored away in the ocean interior for uh, decades, centuries, potentially longer. And by doing that, the Southern Ocean is doing this, this huge climatic favor. So it's moderating and slowing the rate of climate change in the atmosphere. Um, what we don't know is how long it's going to keep doing that for at the same rate as it is today. Our models are inadequate for making projections on that, I would say. We need more process-based understanding and we need to improve the models. Um, and that will feed directly into improved climate projections. Um, but I think that is one of the, one of the frontiers of the science we're at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other points? No.